Witty, thought-provoking, and uplifting, Southern Soul Livestream is a program that you'll invite your friends over to watch every week, where you'll learn about interesting guests and get to share in their fascinating experiences. Tune in each Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern to connect with guests from across the generations and to laugh with our eclectic hosts, who are as charming as they are talented. Welcome, welcome to Soul Thursdays. You know, I I tried something different. I'm going to read some intros. You know, I've been working this... uh, job and i don't get to present often right so then i got a little rusty so going back to rusty tech shot i want to try this so you know tonight we decided to do a show entitled redefining education with k through 12 innovation tonight we will explore groundbreaking approaches to educating children beyond traditional models so if you're a parent seeking innovative solutions for your child's education you want to hear what rivers academy is doing Their model is among at least many cutting edge alternatives that offers unique educational experiences designed for students who thrive with exposure to diverse cultures, experiential learning, travel, and global adventures. First up, we actually have a parent from Rivers County, Brian. Brian is a dedicated parent at Rivers Academy. He has sought an alternative education for his child or children. I can't remember. And he loves the individual attention, the quality preparation, and the both many world, excuse me, world experiences that his child, his children are receiving. Welcome, Brian. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me on the pod. I really appreciate it. It's been great. Well, I, I appreciate you being here, man. You know, it's kind of cool, right? Because I run into a lot of people and a lot of people are like, yeah, you know, you got a, a podcast. One of my favorite jokes is I ran into old classmates and like, yeah, you got your little podcast thing. And I was like, what? Was that shade? But one thing I love about Brian is that I'll connect with Brian and he will remember the episodes better than me. And he'll be like, the person said this and said this. I'm like, man, I have no idea what that person said, right? That was a year. That was two. That was years ago, right? But I appreciate you for not only being a strong supporter of Soul Thursdays, but also of Rivers Academy. So, you know, go ahead and just introduce yourself and let people know a little bit about you. Sure, sure. So Brian Hall, I live here in Atlanta. I've been here for many years, 20 plus years. And uh, when it came to my daughter's education, you know, I kind of was thinking about what do we want to do? Where do we want to go? What's important to me? And, you know, it kind of, kind of brought me back to what, what was my education like? And my education was a combination of public school, private school, and homeschooling. And my parents, through my 12 years of of education, early education, my parents really struggled with trying to figure out what works really well for Brian, where does he thrive? What helps him as an individual person? What's going to help him grow? And you can see by the three different schools I listed, public, private, and homeschooling, they were really struggling throughout my years to try to find what is that match for him and what works really well. And it it turned out great, by the way. So we're all good. So we think when I thought about that and I think about the experiences that I had when my family shifted to homeschooling for my last three years of high school, that opened up this opportunity for me to be able, me and my sister, to be able to travel in the world. We went to Europe for 30 days. We got to experience real world experiences instead of just reading about it in textbooks. And that was just just an incredible, awesome experience. So when we thought about Julia, my daughter, we don't quite have the time, energy and effort with my corporate job and everything that I do and time, energy and effort to be able to support a homeschooling environment for her. So we looked for alternatives and we were concerned about a traditional model that, you know, would just have thousands and thousands of kids in a high school and where would she fit in and her sports is very different she plays a lot of golf which is a very individual sport and she's highly competitive and plays travel tournaments all around the country and loves what she does is very passionate about that but it requires a lot of time and so where do we find that time and how does she we make sure that she finds that individuality that's important to us and the quality of education that we want So outside of the traditional school to try to find a different model of something that we thought would work better. And, uh, and we found rivers we found rivers through our golf community of other kids that go there that are elite athletes in different forms of fashions that could be swimmers, golfers, actors. They could be any individualized sport that you might think of that's important and are looking for a different type of school and different type of schedule. So that's where we started. 
Awesome. Awesome. So very detailed. You know, I really love an experience because, you know, I often tell people, unless you're working to educate children today, during COVID, post-COVID, it's hard to kind of really see the nuances, the weirdness, the, you know, people like to say, well, times have changed. Well, times have changed again. So thank you, Brian, for sharing that. Tell me this, you know, as a parent at Rivers Academy, what aspects of the school, you know, and you kind of mentioned some of it, you know, your daughter's a, a golf, you know, a golf player. Tell us about, you know, what things really jumped out for you. Sure, sure. Well, one of the biggest ones that the school is probably known for is their schedule. And the schedule is very different. A traditional school would be, you know, 830 in the morning till four or five o'clock at the end of the day and takes up a lot of time, five days a week and focus on studies and everything, but it doesn't give you a lot of freedom. So with with Jennifer, who you guys are going to speak with here in a minute, and the way she coordinated the schedule is an ability for these kids to be able to focus on their interests that they have that are successful interests for them outside of just education. So their education is very important, but they need time to be able to focus on these other crafts to become really good at them. So for example, the main schedule includes not going to the physical school on Mondays. It includes working from home on Mondays. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is basically a half day where the kids get there around 7.50 or so, and they work their school schedules until about 12.30 or so. And then they head home and they work on their crafts. And every Friday, they do the same thing. So it teaches these kids to become very independent. My daughter comes home and she spends a lot of time working independently, working with her trainers, working with her, uh, you know, her sports, her, her golf instructor, her physical trainer, uh, her strength coach, her mental coach, everybody that we've invested into to try to help make her become a great person. And then when she's at Rivers and she's getting her time with her teachers, the education level is so high. She has the ability to do advanced classes. She has the ability to present in front of audiences. She has the the independentness um, and everything that goes along with that. So that part's been really good. But I, I will tell you this, probably one of my favorite things is, is what it's done for her mental health. And it's a game changer. It's really made a big impact when, you know, Julia came to us in, in eighth grade and was like, hey, I really want to look at an alternative. We said, fantastic. We love the idea. And the more we thought about it, the more we talked about it, we moved her to Rivers. We weren't really sure how it was going to work because she was leaving some of her friends, this, that, and the other. And right out of the gate, I'm talking like three days in, we noticed that she had a much hap- she had a much better spirit. She was in great moods constantly. She was loved school. A couple of days in, she said, I'm going to be here for the next four years. And this whole mental mental you know challenge for these kids that they have been struggling with their iphones and people and social environments pressures of the world all these things coming together on these teens it made a huge difference for us and it's made a huge difference in her growth so that's probably one of my favorite things about it is finding that balance for her awesome awesome brian well thank you for getting us started and introducing rivers feel free to hang out we're going to do some q a a little bit later after we have our session with our second speaker, Katrina. But thank you for introducing us. And also for the audience who's listening, hit Brian up in the chat. You know, if you want to connect with him, he's a really, really stand-up guy. Just hit him up in the chat. Say, I would love to chat with you about some of your experiences in parenting and how you transition, you know, to such a different approach at education. So Brian's a cool guy. He'll definitely respond. He'll definitely spend some time with you. Hey, Jennifer, how you doing? How does it feel to hear one of your parents just really just brag about your school? Oh, my goodness. I'd be so proud. How do you feel? I mean, my smile, my face hurts already. I'm smiling a lot of brands. I had the pleasure of getting to teach Julia this year. So there's no hole um, and, and in literature. It's a great family. But, yeah, I mean, when you have a school and you have something that's so outside of the norm, you know, and that's your reason behind it. It's that balance of Brian mentioned you know, the, you do all these things, the late night, the open houses, the brainstorming sessions, the passion with this this experience that and the family has experience it. So being able to hear fathers say, you know, that, that balance, that mental health piece uh, and just I mean that's all we did. Awesome, awesome. Well let me read a little bit about you so the audience can know who you who you are, who you is. Jennifer Cantor is a University of North Georgia graduate. And she is the principal and co owner of Rivers Academy. She transformed the school with innovative practices, winning three state championships and expanding its facilities. She has been recognized 
with the Women Influencing Business Rising Store Award in 2020, Jennifer is passionate about community support and enjoys camping with her family. Jennifer, under the leadership under Jennifer's leadership, Rivers Academy has won three state championships in golf and swimming. Congratulations, Jennifer! It's such an awesome you know journey you've had. Tell me this: Can you tell us a little bit about that journey? Like, what got you into the field of education, and what inspired you? What inspired you to focus on K through twelve? What I'm calling K through twelve innovation or doing school differently? Yeah. So, ironically. I went to college to be a teacher, and I remember sitting in, they went to the third class, and I remember as they were talking to us in the education program, thinking, right, but hey, this is box that they're expecting us to teach from. Like, we got to do this certain way and say these certain things. And also, like, they were asking us to facilitate instead of teach. So I thought, uh, the teachers that I remember were the ones that were like, sitting on the table, quoting Shakespeare, and making the songs from our chemistry formulas. So, that box was not going to work for me. So I actually left uh, that vegetation program. Uh, I'm going to be a minor to write as graceful novels for women and women. And then I heard my name talk to you, but I never had a very good English degree. And so, hey, listen, there's a school that's really different. That's an um, they're looking for my English teacher. And what was a private education, you can't have that big reading that area you teach. I didn't necessarily need that education degree because I was an English teacher. So I paid and thought, okay, not only are these teachers with that box this entire school, like, ah, never heard of this program. I've never heard of schools doing it in three days, much less three half days. Um, that I bought into the vision of the founder of the school was right on an iPad and the teachers that she recruited were just the dictionaries, you know, and they were getting in there and being able to be authentic to uh, who that has to be in the classroom and they had a tiny and it's done just to throw on, but I did not have a husband or someone at the time. And I wanted to row with the school, and I was lucky enough to be able to do that. And then I was an English teacher, and then they came to our positions, and then principal. And then I ended up in the school in my best step in 2018. Uh, and we just continued to live out that mission. It's been a true honor uh, to serve families like Ryan. Family and just to be able to be in an area in a tying or kids D told me, you know, other man of education, I think, should be able to be something that every child and every family can cherish because I, I think we need to go to the company. I think any of the options I've ever did. Awesome. Awesome. What an what excellent journey. You know, I'm always a fan of people who trust that instinct, right? That, that intuition, intuition, that thing that tells them, hey, I, I feel it needs to be done a little differently. Did you have any pivotal moments or experiences that shape your vision for Rivers? Did you always know or did you get in and then you feel, you know, maybe something needs to be tweaked a little bit? Tell us about that. Yeah, so as an English teacher, um, just watching these students. So a, a lot of our student body is made up of students who are elite athletes, right? So kids that need to be on the golf course, the, the sloaning pool, the gymnastics, you know, all of these sessions to buy certain time so that it can get those hours and get that training in. Um, so watch these young women that are doing these sports and young men that are doing these sports. They would get to our school and a lot of these students went right They It had to be this way to know the timeline. And what we see if these kids come in, uh, and just the, the all the stretch, try to make they, that have everything lined up perfectly, and they got to know the extra credit, and the same amount has to meet the holding them. But then a little bit of time, you would see the, these young men and women go from like this, carrying that stress around, to just like, whoo, okay. And I think uh, it was probably my second month with TG, and my little sixth grader was a Jenna. Um, I remember asking her, you know, she was talking to me about homework, and she had very little time to direct. The hunt at them. I mean, you're going to school three hot days a week. You're in sixth grade. Like, what should we look like? If this is, if it's hard to just hold what we're doing here. Uh, but I remember her telling me, you know, I, in the gym doing gymnastics, 25 different hour whole week. And I mean, I knew we were working the bad weeks. So I thought, I'm doing this so much. I'm like, it's just great. Five hours for you is a, a lot. And so it hit me. There are children out there of a lot of children who want to do that sports piece or do and be a part of film making and television or build robotics or they'll work with their real father at a local college and build a telescope that we had in for our studio new. So it's like you've got this piece of school that you don't want them to best, but you should also need to realize you still think it is a loss. 
So like they, they need to be able to have this academic piece, you know, sports piece and the family piece, this vacation piece, because you take the child one time. You take the fear of what experience is when an actual child wants. And so it was that, that moment, you know, I thought like the wind was blowing and the little light from God was showing and everything was kind of here for this moment for me to realize that this isn't just for one child. This needs to be for children and family and teachers. And I think that's when I just really fall into it. Like, hey, you've got to get more kids this ability to have this balance. Wow. I love it. I love it. You know, here at Soul Thursday, we love to talk about what I call the messy middle. I imagine this great vision you had, this conviction you had, wasn't always easy to convince other people. Did you have any, well, tell us about some of your biggest challenges you face in trying to implement this innovative practices at Rivers. And did you have to overcome any resistance from the traditionalists or stakeholders? The funny is funny, you know, when, when you get here, you know that saying, you can't explain that. From the inside looking out, to far bit explain them. From the outside looking at, it's hard to understand. And that is so much the time you're looking at it, right? You hear these kids go to school three half days a week. How can they be learning? Like, how, how is how are they even doing that? So imagine when we call what Leslie Vance said, it's now found yeah, and environment dance there, it's called staffs. Um, when we call them, we're like, hey, so we have a school that only is in sessions three days a week, and we really want to get accredited. But we on the same foundation that the big private schools are seeing. So and that was our first piece of resistance because it was a thing. You're going to do what now up? And there was a lot of trouble with them understanding what we were doing and how we were doing it. So visit extra reviews for these engaged sessions where they come and make sure you're really not be staying or knowing that you're really living it for a doing that academic piece. We were all wearing her because we really we had to convince this, this group of vegetators, but also prove ourselves. You know, that okay, this is it. Like, you're the same, we're doing it. But I think in that moment, it was when, you know, the hardest piece was just to put everything into action and have the teacher interviews, the parent interviews, the student interviews. Um, and it was met with some pretty soft criticism about, you know, this team showed up, there were four individuals, they came and they were like, wow, we've heard with you, you know, you're saying you're doing this, so, you know, you're less of land, that you're only meeting 108 days, and, you know, we're both thinking, we're going to stay. I did that, and they said it was fresh and some of them were on their columns. The students would come back, be like, Miss Kendall, you know, I thought the whole thing not being my And so we were really nervous, like, okay, we're going to do things so touch hesitant, and they don't want to set up there this school that doesn't know about this brand new with us. We would be the first of our kind with three days or half days, and then never have all these young people start with self education. What we did. And they were just giving tough love. They were really trying to push and stretch us to show and prove that we were viewing all of these great things that we were doing. And you got some good little reach out of rankings. We got some great feedback. But the most importantly, when they presented us forward, they said, you know, your kids love being here. And the highest point the guys received was classroom instruction. Where else do you want those high scores? Classroom instruction. So, um, as she gives it to have that, she'll say it. Because it's just, it's a reminder that if you who are met with resistance at the beginning, keep going. Because if you know around you that are, that are tight with you, that are walking the clock, if you sure now you be doing it for this reason and you believe in what they're doing, man, when they're sitting on the side of you, you can't just stop. And here we are. If we're doing it for our 17th school year, we met the same amount of resistance to one line half scores. Because you've defined him. I just told the said, oh, yeah, I don't want to go to school train that place to be. You want this works too? I'm like, yes, to do it. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. You know, I get chills just hearing you talk about it. Kudos to you. I love it. Love it when a plan comes together, as they say, you know, as Katie would say, some people too old to know what that, young to know what that means, I think. Anyway, I love it. I love it. I mean, tell us about this. I mean, I, I like to do the SWAT, right? You know, the great things that happen and the challenging things. Did you have any projects? That didn't work? Did you have any things that didn't go as planned? Or maybe you're still working on it? The, I think the challenge at the very beginning was finding the right student for Rivers Academy. Because in this car, you know, the fire of the school used to somehow everybody tainted it, yeah. 
as the grad tell me too, because you get on the school and grab my teeth and adjust. But you learn that when you're in school three days on the you students who are motivated. There are students like I I need you five days a week. But do not try to think about five days on that the three days because I am not gonna be thriving in that. But the you see, we learn very quickly that people on the students aren't going to give them homework and they're not gonna be motivated or if students don't have parental support or more of just like the the idea that education is a priority and they don't prioritize that. I think that's a tough lesson of just learning that there might not be a school for everybody in the sense of you got to work hard to make it work. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Now we're going to shift to the final questions. And then what we're going to do is we're going to uh, transition to our next speaker. And then you guys can hit up Jennifer and Brian in the chat if you have any questions. And if they have time to hang out with us, we'll bring them back after um, Katrina. And maybe we'll do some voice Q&A for you guys to ask them questions. As I was telling Katie earlier, we like to build awareness here at Soul Thursdays, but not just awareness. We call it the knowing. But now that we know, because Jennifer has shared with us her journey, let's talk about the navigating. What advice, Jennifer, would you give to educators or school administrators who are looking to introduce innovative practices in their own schools? The severe people. Trust the people that are in those classrooms. You can't know these still for an interview. Just go back all the call halls and sitting in the classroom and shaking hands of the kids and doing half hours when these students walk in the door. Your teachers have been put in that classroom for a reason. I trust your teachers. They are the brains of this operation. They are the light of this operation. Um, they have phenomenal ideas, but they're also the ones that bring the passion. Uh, so you got to take the right people, but let those people are on your team. And you got to help them help you leave. That. So I would say trust your teacher to ask them how to shake it up. You know, challenge does the three pages of sacrament. We have a first day of school challenge where I tell our teachers, I uh, want you to watch this film as well. Have to festivals? Yes, you get trophies and discards and like the teachers who have the most creative and innovative lessons and then talk about the vert safe challenge. That fast does is easy. You don't have to know the webinars or you know, conferences that are in those kind of things. So challenge the teachers, trust your teachers, and just fade off in the box. What would you have enjoyed? Talk to your kids, your students. What do you want to see happen at the school? And just scare the dream and go after it. Thank you. Thank you. A couple more questions. How do parents and communities support educational innovation? Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, let's take and show up to your school, but I'll have to have, you know, people in the social media here or even in the the culture shop where I was up in that panel. My school is a desert. My teachers are building a desert. I wish they changed this. My first response would be, well, well how are you just afraid of that school? How are you going to volunteer? Um, because you're staying a snapshot of a family in that school. We've been knocking on the Saturday and Mondays, we just up on the time, organize the flash train. They're certainly not shopping for them at Fargate and they're trying to, you know, they out of their pocket to supply that flash train. So volunteer first, all their support first. And then you'll see that, you know, that, that can change the tide for these educators and the high schools and the communities for sure. Awesome. Awesome. And last question before we transition. Feel free to hang out as long as you um, are available. And, you know, also for the audience who are listening, make sure you hit up Jennifer, hit up in the chat, let her know if you have some questions for us. And if she gets a chance to hang out, she'll maybe come back with Brian on video and we'll get a chance to um, ask her some more questions. Um, last question. I love the fact that you're on the cutting edge. I work in technology. And one of the things I do is always try to stay on the cutting edge, you know, 5, 10, 15 years and what's getting ready to happen. What are some upcoming trends you see in developments, well, upcoming trends in K-12 education that you're seeing that maybe you're getting excited about? Just the idea of collaboration. I think this technology piece, uh, AI, is starting to scare a lot of the I think they are resistant to it. Change is scary, right? And we never deserve that whole thing. You should have heard what we thought was going to happen when they started talking about produce on in the bathroom. So not resisting. That's my age, but I'm racing it and walking your students through how to do that and go to and into the classroom and make it a resource and an enhancement and not something that I'm scared to use. Um, but I think I'm really excited to see how students just continue to collaborate. I think that's such a key to what makes them excited about school. And I'm not caught in like three people staying in love in the classroom with a poster board and they each just be face to speak on. I've taught them that collaborate. Rainstorm, you can have your virtual meeting, I'm going to the coffee house, share your ideas, and take your agency together as a team because that, that oracy and getting up and presenting 
toughness builds learning. And I think that's the not only my key, but you overlook so much because when kids are confident, they learn they learn that bigger pace on it, but they become something that they probably didn't think they could be. So I think you begin on that piece of collaboration and getting and set up classrooms and presenting and being advocates for themselves. Um, my futures have ever fears and it is essential. So collaboration, a very long winded way of saying collaboration and technology to help do that. Yeah, and, and thank you for sharing that because you know if I think about my background from engineering school to business school, collaboration are key skills that we walked away with. Key skills that when I look around at certain industries, I'm like, think how to collaborate, okay? So kudos to you for doing that. Any last um, final words you wanna share with us? First of all, thank you, Jennifer, for being here and really, really blessing us with your, your energy, your passion, and your story. Because it's so, so motivational, it's so inspirational, and it lets us know the journey and what it takes to really live out their dreams. Any any last words, any things you would like to wrap up? You know, forget about my canned questions. Anything you'd like to share? Yeah, no, thank you. First of all, thank you for having me. Well, I was just talking about education, like the fit. I left the degree of going to be a teacher in your education. So when I told my friends out the college, with the other private school and our principal, the laughter is uh, with money. That's just like, like the barracks. And to, you know, family members and friends and those of you who just have to live in your life. Talk to them, ask them how it's going, show them support, then look for options. For so long, we thought we have to do education this particular way, which is there aren't really options. And there are options out there. There truly are. Search for them, ask for them, go sit inside and find more resources online. I reach out to me, I have it to share. Uh, but yeah, just ask questions. And, you know, remember school's not just about the academic piece. Yes, that's important, but so much more of how it's the confidence um, and just learning how to navigate this. I think Charlie, you said earlier that we aren't meant to navigate alone. I would say the same thing for kids and schools. They weren't created, they, they weren't they are meant to navigate this whole educational experience and career alone. So these are part to to navigate that for them, for sure. I love it. I love it. Thank you, Jennifer, very much. Oh, gee, you know, I, I love that, the knowing, the navigating, and we... We're not meant to navigate alone. You know, we keep this dictionary of Soul Thursday's phrases. And some of them, it's, it's my neurodivergent slip-ups. You know, I think one of my favorite ones is nerky. I still don't know what nerky means, but it's going down in the Soul Thursdays. But in addition, we were not meant to navigate alone. What's up, Katrina? How you feeling? I am good. Thank you for asking. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for hanging out with us, you know, just vibing with us a little bit. Tell people a little bit of something about you. I mean, you're dropping in from Oklahoma, right? Tell people a little bit something about you and what you do. Yes, yes. I am. Live, I live in Oklahoma, Norman, Oklahoma, to be exact. A lot of people are familiar with Norman. It's associated with the University of Oklahoma, Boomer Sooner. So I like to always throw that out there. Uh, that's where I went to college. I am a LCSW, licensed clinical social worker, own a private practice that's virtual based. I see clients here in Oklahoma as well as Texas. I am extremely passionate about mental health. I have been in the field of mental health over a decade now. And outside of being a private practice owner and being a therapist, I also do a lot of mental health advocacy work online. I have a social media presence. The name to it now because someone told me, you're like a mental health influencer. I was like, I guess so. And so that's my way of spreading mental health awareness about self-care and specifically the, the demographic I work with, which is Gen Z and millennial T-year-olds and women. So yes, yeah, kind of a overview of my, my story. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. And before I go to your first questions, let me just read a little backdrop for the audience. Gen Z faces significant pressures from various sources that impact their mental health, from academic and career expectations, performance anxiety, and even financial concerns, concerns contribute to their success, excuse me, to their stress. Social media, in addition to privacy risk, cyberbullying, screen time addiction, Gen Z struggles with a lot. To continue, there's topics such as body image issues and the pressure to conform while maintaining their own personal and cultural identity. Even family and media expectations can further compound these challenges that Gen Z generation is seeing. Conflicts between traditional roles, generational values, and societal standards begin to challenge this next generation. It's important that we begin to understand the multifaceted concerns 
and it is crucial to our understanding in order, in order that we may better support our Gen Z next generation. So for you, Katrina, tell me this. Can you share your personal journey that led you to become a licensed clinical social worker and mental health advocate? And we're going to call it mental health influencer. Share with us your journey. Yeah. So I like to always be a little backstory. I'm a product of a teen mom and it was very much of a struggle for the most part growing up with a teen mom. But I also learned a lot about myself and my mental health struggles that I experienced that I was exposed to, but also individually dealt with. And so I won't get into too many details, but I also dealt with abandonment issues. I dealt with depression. I dealt with a series of trauma. And I knew that I always wanted to figure out my problems as well as my family's problems, but I didn't know in what capacity. Um, I, I usually let people know I wanted to be a doctor of some sort because I knew doctors help people. But once I got closer to college, I was like, you know what? I want to be a therapist. But I don't really know the path to, to becoming a therapist. And so once I got to um, my college, I was introduced to the field of social work. And most people, when they hear social work, they associate that with taking people's kids away and working for DHS, which, you know, that's a fraction of it. You can become a licensed clinical social worker. So I decided to pursue my MSW, my master's degree, and to become I'm a private practice owner and to expand my business, I had to become licensed. So I had to get the LCSW to the MSW. And so that allowed me to create my own path and design my own practice where I work with the demographic of Gen Z and millennials that battle with anxiety, burnout, you know, perfectionism, people pleasing, a lot of the issues that a lot of Gen Z um, populations struggle with. And so it's allowed me to further my career. It's allowed me to reach a lot of people. And yeah, that's what helped me get to where I am today, ultimately. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. You know, you, you've launched and established multiple businesses, right? The Elevate Mental Wellness and K. Nicole Writing LLC. We're going to talk about that a little bit later, but can you describe a pivotal moment in your career that really solidified your commitment to working with adolescents, adolescents, young adults, and Gen Z? Yeah. So my background is in working from a community mental health aspect. So I work in um, an agency here in Norman, Oklahoma, where I was able to work with a, a series of different people from different backgrounds, um, but like families, teens, youth, couples. And I never really gravitated towards the older, like geriatric age, like population. I feel like everyone has a niche. Everyone has a calling. My calling was working with young adults and working with you. And before I became a therapist, because you have to get a lot of hours, a lot of training, a lot of consultation, I need case management work. So I was in the field in people's homes and literally seeing young people in broken situations. And it was just heartbroken because some of them really didn't have a voice or have a way out and were kind of stuck in these situations. And so seeing this over and over and over really led me to want to figure out a way to help them in a capacity that their environment couldn't help them in. And so just seeing those, those situations over and over, it definitely inspired me to work with this population. And then I always could relate to them. I could never get away from it, ultimately, even if I tried. And so I worked in schools, loved it. And then I always had like a really good success rate with that population. And so I was like, this is where I need to be. And this is where I will continue. I love it. That, that intuition, that feeling, you know, that calling that says, this is for me. Tell me this. Let's let's talk about Gen Z a little bit. I mean, Gen Z. Yeah, Gen Z. In your experience, what are some of the most common issues that you see Gen Z facing today? You meet with a lot of clients. You get the chance to talk to them. Tell us, what is Gen Z facing today? Gen Z, they are stressed out. They are burnt out. They are overwhelmed. A lot of Gen Z deal with a sense of loneliness a sense of feeling like they don't matter or misunderstood. There's a lot of pressure from social media because of 
excessive screen time, comparing yourself, they're seeing everyone become these influencers, they're making money, they have nice homes. Um, even the current political climate, because you really don't know what's going to happen, economic uncertainty, you know, when it comes to their social socioeconomic status, maybe not, ha not having enough funds, not having enough money, or fear of not ever having enough, and then academic and school pressure, and unfortunately, like mass shootings, you know, just the fear of just even being in school physically and so i see that quite a bit and that turns into stress that results into depression and or anxiety and it's just like a spiral and a continuation and so that's what i see mostly working to the teens that are gen z and then the young adults that are gen z and college specifically is a huge stress as well and the pressure of even trying to get into college and then furthering your career you know post-graduation thanks for sharing that you know I can only imagine the misconceptions, right, about anxiety and depression, even with Gen Z. Have you seen any misconception or misunderstanding either with Gen Z about mental health, anxiety, and depression with, you know, older parents or relatives? What are some of the nuances you've seen? That Gen Z are overly sensitive, very lazy, and solely dependent upon technology. But the thing is, you have to remember that Gen Z is a generation that literally grew up using social media and the internet like that's what they were exposed to and they just have a different way of navigating you know certain situations and expressing themselves and so just because you know being a boomer or a millennial we we were raised on different times and so we just had different ways of communicating and expressing our and I think that because of a lack of understanding or just listening and trying to understand a Gen Z's personality or their behavior it immediately is a label attached to it, whether, again, they're overly sensitive, they're lazy, disengaged, and only care about social media. When, if you think about it, a lot of them are business-driven, politically engaged. You know, they are, they are blunt. You know, they speak out loud. They have a voice. They will advocate, and I see it. And so those are some common, you know, misconceptions that I see with, the, with this demographic. Thanks for sharing that. How about the navigating? Right. I can only imagine, you know, that you as a therapist, you get to think about practical steps to help people get to a better place. Do you have any recommendations, any practical steps that Gen Z individuals can take right now to better manage their anxiety, depression and some of the pressures they're experiencing? So off the jump, I'm going to say invest in real self-care. And I'm not talking about just the luxury farms where, you know, you go to a spa and you get your nails done and things like that, which is, which is nice. But I'm talking about boundary setting, setting them and enforcing them, practicing self-compassion, being nice to yourself, even when you don't feel deserving, going outdoors, exercising, moving your body, literally getting out of the house, cultivating meaningful connections. Because Gen Z is heavy in social media, cultivating meaningful connections to connect with people in person and so making sure you're getting out and about and, and seeing people and spending time with people that you have healthy relationships with monitor your social media consumption social media is not going anywhere so just think about the breaks that you can take social media detoxes that you can implement and then as a therapist if you can see a therapist you know depending on the severity of your mental health um because it's always helpful to talk to a professional that specializes in these situations and in these issues. Thank you. I'm going to drop into the chat some information that you provide. Tell us about some of the resources that you're providing for teen girls and women. And in addition, you have some free tools that you have to share. Tell us about that. So my mental wellness self-care business, which is Kano Co-Writing, on my website, I created tons of uh, worksheets and different exercises that are easily accessible that you can download. Uh, and there are different ones that are focused on specific needs that you can just download and save. Usually I have people ask if they're allowed to use them in any capacity. I don't care. Just don't alter them and give me my credit because I work really hard to create those different resources. But those are all on my website. And outside of that, I do provide different trainings and workshops, you know, that are centered around mental health care, self-care, women's issues, anxiety, depression, and things of, like, of that nature. So, yeah, everything's easily accessible on the website. Thank you. Two more questions. I'm going to bring back Brian, Jennifer, and you, and we're just going to do a panel of questions from the audience where we can just talk about it. Okay. Um, for parents and educators, um, what advice do you have 
on how we can better support young people struggling with mental health issues. Jennifer kind of said it earlier, and I'm going to kind of piggyback, especially as a therapist who has worked um, in school settings and work with young people, listen to their needs and understand not to just respond, like literally sit and have conversations to understand the severity of their issues. Because if you don't create a safe space for these kids and for these young adults, they're not going to want to be, they're not going to want to talk about the problems. They're not going to be open and be specific about their needs. Making sure that you are involved in some type of way, educate yourself. There's tons of information online, whether you are joining online groups or groups in person, listen to articles or reading articles, listen to podcasts, books, educate yourself because if once you get a basic understanding of certain mental health needs it makes more sense and then educators i would say bringing in like mental health uh, professionals that can not just to the students but even do presentations for the or i'm sorry not just for the, the also provide trainings or presentations for the students because that shows that okay we're advocating but we're also prioritizing mental health and not just talking about it when something wrong is going on in the world or something tragic might happen to the students. It just create that safe space for them to talk about their mental health needs. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I think we still got, you know, our previous speakers hanging out. So what I'm going to do is ask them to kind of join. So audience, this is your opportunity. You know, I do my canned questions because I like to get things warmed up. But one thing I love here with Soul Thursdays, we apply approach that allows you to get close and personal with the speakers. It allows you to ask questions. It allows you to kind of, you know, really take the topic and let's make it less um, intimidating in a safe environment. Katie always liked to have the first question and y'all just so y'all don't warn y'all, Katie's question is going to be really long and she's going to use some fancy GMAT words and just breathe and just, you know, go with the flow. Anyway, in the meantime, audits, type your question in the chat. And if you feel so led, I'm going to get, I'm going to allow you to unmute yourself. So if you want to raise your hand and unmute yourself and we'll um, essentially either read your question for you or we'll let you speak it yourself. Katie, first question for our speakers. Sure, in Anne's trend, this place, I think I had a question that was already asked and answered. I don't know if everybody actually saw it, but it was a question to Brian from Margaret. Um, I want, don't want to put your name, but it might be Zoza. And she asked essentially about whether students, and Jennifer, this could be for you too, perhaps, but whether students in that setting that you're in, whether they have earlier access to recruiters, you know, earlier knowledge about scholarships and things like that. Studying allow for students and Connie's parents to really help that student hone their craft and get noticed earlier. Yeah, he said it was going to be a long question. I lost you in the. Uh, I told y'all. No, I was busy. With the high line, take it this or not. Go ahead, Jennifer. You're good. Go ahead. So um, I think that the key is is not thinking that um, I mean, it's not it's the same. So our assistant principal, her relationship with these students, I believe, is what starts in Germany. It's actually not even the sports. It's letting these kids know there is the sports piece. Yes, the sports piece is, is a huge part to it. But you got to start. What is your story? Where do you want to go to school? What do you want to do? How are you going to tell your story through your actions? So I think that when these students come in and they have a lot of time to focus on finding out the core foundation pieces of their, their story, that's key, right? You know, if you have a young woman who's looking to go into pre-net at a head, she's also a soccer player. She may be able to use some of this time to go work in a nursing home or go with internship with a holistic doctor that's nearby. So I think that that time piece is crucial, but also just getting them to know themselves who they are and finding their social media handles. All of those things come together just by thinking about it earlier and you're not afraid of year. As this journey, right? So many kids think about it as they're in the, the destination. Like, I've got to get to that school. Like, I've got to or I've got to be living in this state and going to this university. There is so much between now and that piece. And I, once they start buying into the whole journey and the process, that's when the recruiters start noticing more. I'm sorry, I talked. I can give you such a long answer. No, great. It's actually a great answer. And, and it also makes me think about some. 
some of the things that Katrina was saying too, right? So how do you, if you've got a child that's appreciating the journey more, right? How do you balance that in terms of mental health, right? Because part of the issue is these, a lot of children are super focused on getting into mom and dad's alma mater, right? They're super focused on getting into Harvard or wherever. So how do you balance or how should one balance what you're saying in terms of being appreciative of the journey with actually yeah. making sure that that's something that's suited to still book today. Let's give that one to Kachina and Brian. So I think Brian first, Brian, you want to, I think you have a great story and testimony when it comes to managing mental health. Any, you want to take a swag sure. at that one? Sure, sure. I mean, at the end of the day, if I think about what some of the challenges are for all of us that Katrina works with her students and 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 folks with, kids and parents and Jennifer works with her students and parents with a lot of the social media aspects and let's just call it like the iPhones and everything the dynamic of how our world is today with all the digital content like Katrina said it's not going away so how do we find that balance of how much of it do you where are the benefits of it and what's really a waste of time like if you notice if you watch a child who's looking at their iPhone after about 15, 20 minutes of watching Instagram reels and you ask them a question, they're like a vegetable. They can just, you can just see they're, they're not coherent. They're, they're halfway fried and it takes five minutes to come back. So you realize there's parts of that that are important for them to be a part of society and to share their thoughts and, and everything. But then there's the other part that's how much is too much. So, and especially when you move to the classroom, what the a big question for the group too might be does society allow cell phones for students in the class and it's a little bit controversial right some schools like a traditional school may allow kids to have their phones in high school and they sit at their desk and they can do whatever they want it's up to them others may be a little bit more of a controlled scenario or a little bit more of a flow check them in at the door when you come into class we need to make sure you're paying attention this these, this is school. We got to make sure the kids are on task with their education. But I think finding a balance, I think finding a balance throughout everything for all these kids is really important. And like Katrina said earlier, paying attention to the kids' dynamics of where they are. Where are they with their friends, their girlfriends, their boyfriends, their teachers, their other influences, their social influences, and staying fully involved as parents? That's probably the biggest one. Thank you, Brian, for that. And I love that response. Moderation is key. Thank you for sharing that. How about a question for, we're going to take a couple more questions and then we're going to wrap up. Support our community journalism by buying us a call for coffee, excuse me, a cup of coffee. I love the expensive cup of coffee. How much cup of coffee costs? Is it like $2? Um, what question do you have for Katrina, uh, can, Katie? Can we get Katrina actually to respond to that previous question? And, and oh. the nuance of that, I think, would also be in terms of how can parents help those students navigate that. It was it was really about the balance that kids have to, the, the tightrope that kids are walking, right? And the yeah. influences that Brian was talking about in terms of um, social media and what it does to kids' heads, right? So how do we how do we make certain that kids are achieving and that they're able to um, that that high level of achievement that they want to have? How do we do that without them, you know, going off the deep end? Yeah, I, I love that, Katrina. And, and this is you know just kind of an observational type thing. Brian kind of talked about balance, and he also shared with us a great story of how his daughter actually had increased value of mental health while being at Rivers Academy. What have you seen and what are maybe some of the things that you maybe recommend when it comes to social media, digital connectedness? Have you had to step into any of those conversations? Definitely. Well, because, I, again, I've worked on both sides of the spectrum where I'm obviously in private practice now, but I was a therapist in a school setting. And so being in school settings, I always love that they had the option to be able to talk to someone that was mental health focus because sometimes the guidance counselors may have too much on their plate but have some obviously some experience where they can talk to the student but there needs to be some type of streamlined service or some referral set up where they can just refer out students based on their mental health needs but also when their mental health is being discussed let's not just quickly dismiss it and have some type of option where they can decompress or encourage a mental health day you know because it can be so much you know on the on the students but um, I would say, especially to create, to help create a balance, because that's what I was understanding for the question, making sure that the schools just 
prioritize mental health, like in all capacities. And if it's too much on you, making sure you bring someone in that is a trained professional, because a lot of these kids that I see, like the stress is coming from school or college and they don't feel like they have the right support system or they don't feel like they're being fully supported. And so sometimes they have to leave school or have to go to a virtual, you know, option because school is just so overwhelming. And so I think if school is just really, or some schools, but not all schools are like this, but fully support the students. Um, that can help create a balance. And if it's too much or more of a higher need, then obviously we need to get them higher level of care with a mental health professional. So. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. I want to say thank you to all of my speakers and James, we're going to address your question and for being here tonight. You know, we tend to have a good time. So thank you guys for hanging out. We typically have morning people. Y'all can always tell morning people, you know, I get at night, I just kind of wake up. But the morning people be like, Lord, I think it's nine o'clock. Once again, as a reminder, we're getting ready to take two weeks off. We're coming back with two great shows. I don't even have my list of what we're going to cover next week. Anyway, I'll email you. Make sure that if you sign up, let's see if I can get my, uh, I don't even know where it's at right now. Well, he's finding that Reverend, we just see your hand up, Reverend Larry. Right, so, anyway, so that, that, that was a question for Reverend Larry. Okay, cool. But let me read those questions and I'm going to read all the questions and Reverend Larry, I'm going to let you unmute yourself and we're not going to hold our speakers, but we're going to definitely do some open discussions, what we do. So let me read the few questions and Reverend Larry, I'll let you kind of speak. So one question, James says, how do we spread this to public school? I love that question with a whole bunch of prayer, but, but we could talk about that. Also, Margaret, a frequent supporter what do we do to support young people with social and mental health issues where there isn't just a single parent or a double parent household, but they may be too busy or they may be absent. So there's a gap, right? Where it's not only parents there. And then Reverend um, Larry, talk to us. What's your question? Hey, good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. This is um, Larry. Um, I am in um, Durham, North Carolina. I am the founder and the CEO of Thomas Mentor Leadership Academy, where we provide love, leadership, and mentorship for boys 7 to 18 who's being raised by a single parent or their grandparents. I am delighted about this conversation here tonight because we do a lot of work with these young men and I am a adult in youth mental health certified, but I wanted to share this. We did an exercise with our boys and we asked them to, we did this mask exercise and we asked them to write on the front of the mask what they show the world every day, but they don't mind showing the world every day. And they wrote things like, I'm kind, I'm intelligent, I'm handsome, I have good integrity, I'm I'm happy, hardworking, and respectful. So we asked them to write on the back side of the mask what they're struggling with, what they wanna what they want to show people, but they're afraid, what they want to talk to somebody about. And the same kid who wrote all that wrote stuff like, I'm sad, I'm angry, I'm depressed, I'm frustrated, I have anxiety, I have home issues. So what we did. We don't ask for any names, any data, nothing. It's a blank form. So what we're going to do, we collected all this information from all these kids, and we're going to the school board meeting, and we're going to let the school board and the teachers know, here's what you have coming into your classrooms. Here's what you have coming into your classrooms, the um, things that our kids are dealing with. And just to let them know that, Every kid is different and that our kids are coming into the classroom with some of these things and they need help, community help.